So welcome to another episode of Money in the Bank with Frank. Today we have with us uh, Maxwell Davidson IV, who is joining us uh, as a summary recap to my recent trip to Art Basel 2023. Well, in the short term, we've got, uh, again, as I said, we've got Max with us. And uh, Max, why don't you, well, let me start off first. Max is a multi-generational art dealer with uh, unbelievable expertise going from the bottom all the way through owning his own galleries, uh, runs through the auction houses and have been pretty much entrenched in art for your entire life. Uh, so we, we thought it would be really a great opportunity to uh, have you help me unpack this beginning journey of a noob, uh, as you told me, wannabe collector uh, and, and, and nav help me navigate my way through a first acquisition, if you would. Sure. Um, well, th again, thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's fun to be able to talk about art in a way, uh, a without other art professionals around you, because that can get very, uh, intense, but also just to sort of talk about it in a, in a, in a more of a, uh, just a friendlier, more generalized way. And, sure. you know, I, I know, I know that most wannabe collectors um and i would not use that word because you know once you start once yeah. you start collecting you're a collector and it's not wannabe the first it's just taking that first step but um that kind of that, know, that, I, that, I that definitely speaks to literally like the fear that anybody has when it, it comes to their very first purchase of anything correct. that may be a pecuniary car, value you know so yeah. i project on myself that i'm an idiot because i know right conscious right. incompetence so, you know, it's it's but, important to have someone kind of guide you through that journey. And I figured maybe yeah, we could do it for everybody. Absolutely. And I think I think you could easily take the sort of principles that you would apply to buying your first car, buying your first house. Uh, you know, there is at the end of the day, even though it's a very different way of acquiring um there is common sense to it, you know. Um, there, there's there's basic steps. One is, do you actually like what you are um, uh, looking at? And you know, before you even want to buy it, whether it's something for your portfolio or something for your, you know, uh, what do you guys call it, the asset class? You know, um, the, there is this idea that this is something you're buying and you're living with it just like your car, just like your house, just like you would be buying a new pool, a new dishwasher, whatever. It, you've got to like it. It's got to work for you. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, as with most art, it's not functional, it's form. Mm -hmm. um, and so the form, you know, and th there's the gamut of things. There's Does it, does it match the couch <laughs> and the rug to, wow, that is really beautiful, even though it's wild and not like the rest of your 1920s Tudor house, you know? So there really is a lot of spectrum to each purchase of art and uh, art is really personal. Um, and that's always going to be involved in your decision, especially a first one. Uh, yeah. So, so why don't we, uh, why don't we talk about that beautiful piece of art you've got behind you right now? Okay. Um, sure. That is, um, that's it. There you go. Um, that is an artist named Nikki Brookhuisen who um, is a South African artist um, who uh, is all about binary choice. Um, those, is, I don't know if you can see it, but that, those are all oil paint, but stamps of the numbers one and zero. And that is always her medium. Um, wow, and yeah. it's very much about making choices. Everything in life is a choice to what flavor coffee you have there to, you know, to which stock you're going to tell your clients to buy to, um to everything you know um and so she just sort of believes in this idea that there's a beauty in choice and the forms that she does range from sort of abstraction like this a circle or a mandala to um to more figurative things she's great no that's that's great that's great i i i saw it over your shoulder i was like i'm sure a collector is gonna have or a dealer is gonna have something <laughs> <Yeah>. nice available <laughs> yeah. my my wife loves that being that i'm in her sort of workspace she was like that's what i want behind me and i'm like okay but just remember i, I could be gone one day <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's not like a portrait of the kids like no one's gonna want that one 
Yeah, but it's utility, right? I mean, I wish that if I owned Microsoft sure. stock, I had free use of Microsoft the the, the service, exactly. right? But in this case, is, you, you at least the have the problem. ability to collect it. You know, the funny thing, one of the one of the interesting concepts that I had, the first time I went to work, uh, well, first time I was like prospecting this particular hedge fund that I was talking to one of the managers, mm -hmm. and we were in a brownstone in New York City. And I was like, wow, this is an amazing office. And I realized it was one of the investments of the hedge fund portfolio. I'm like, oh. wow, talk about <laughs> double dipping. That's great. Right, exactly. Yeah. That is what we call not an arm's length transaction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're literally in the, you know, in, in, in what is, 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 is S. So, yeah. So, you know, we have art all over the house, um, which is great. And, you know, a lot of the art decisions in this house, the, the choices, so to speak, are mine. Um, my wife is, my wife likes what she likes. She doesn't like what she doesn't like, which which is kind of great because yeah. there's not there's not a, a, a Yalta conference uh, every time we want to purchase art, you know, uh, or or I bring something home on consignment that's going to be up on the wall for a few months, you know. Yeah, um, it's fair. she gets it, you know. Sounds um, a little safer than you know bringing home a, a lab, you know, a, a rescue <laughs> yes. lab for a couple of days. <laughs> well, yeah, the story of the story of my wife and the lab is is, is a great one, but not on topic. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Very yeah. good. So you like my little slideshow? We had, uh, I just had great. to grab little pieces of everything. There was a couple of pieces in there that were from previous conventions, but I figured it'd be kind of fun to see if anyone would notice. No. Well, and I thought, you know, I thought what was the best part about it was how many mediums you covered. You covered sculpture and video mm -hmm. and painting and drawing. And, um, and that's, that's what you're going to get in an art fair. Um, mm -hmm. It is the gamut. Now, while I thought Basel was very heavy on the painting this year, um, it was it was good to see some sculpture there. Um, uh, it was a little bit um, more abstract than in uh, in past years, uh, which is good. I think we had really gotten into a very figurative. <laughs> Every booth was just big, bright, you know, figurative paintings. Um, as yeah. you can tell, um, I'm a little bit more prone to the abstract, um, but that's just me. I mean, um, you you had everything at your fingertips at the fair, and that was a that was a pretty good amalgamation of what could be seen there. Yeah, and I think that uh, just to take a step back and add a little mm -hmm. color, when I first started doing a little bit of research and was talking uh, with you, it's very important that you know in any industry you learn the lexicon and you learn the things that you need to know before you go into something and then, you know, show the wrong impression and then get pencil whipped. Right. So in this particular right. case, you're saying uh, art fair. And when I mentioned it the first time I said art show and you're like, ah, yeah. <laughs> would you like to go ahead and talk about Aside that? Aside from the raised finger. Yes. I, I would say, <laughs> yes. I was, I was definitely yeah. art show uh, is a is a red flag to the dealer that um, you you this is this may be your first rodeo. Um, so um, love the term pencil whipped. Um, I I think I think nowadays I, I think in the beginning of the art fair era there was uh, you know John John Doe walks into a booth and says how much is this and they say twenty thousand dollars and then um, you know the the person that they really want to sell it to walks in and it's it's fifteen thousand dollars i think but i just don't think you can get away with that anymore because seventy five thousand people are going through these fairs and everybody's asking prices i mean that's that's the one universal sort of term that people ask at these you know is this for sale it, yes how much is it? you know 
Um, I think the first question that everybody in their own mind really thinks is like, can, can you just tell me which one is the right one? Wh which one do I buy? Which one is the right, right. one? Right. And right. that's, yeah. that's easy, but it's, the answer's pretty complicated. Having done, having done these fairs a lot, I've, I've encountered a, a real gamut of questions mm -hmm. from, are these all by the same artists, which, you know, is always a tough one when it's so obviously not, mm -hmm. but more so, you know, which of these two do you like better? That's, that is, that's probably the, you know, if someone's really focused on an artist mm -hmm. and then, and then it gets tough because especially if they're, you know, the same price or the same, you know, same price structure. I mean, what do you tell someone? You, you, yes, I'm, I'm an expert and I have my taste, but like, I don't know where they're putting it and I don't. So I, I, I really try never to answer that question. I can say, I can say, look, I, I prefer this one, but that's because I have uh, bleach bleach floors. I mean, I you could say anything. Um, yeah. So why don't we ask it a different way and maybe yeah. frame it the right way and say, what are Max's rules for anybody who is looking to get into art? And let's start off by saying, maybe just like you do with financial advice, start asking people who you think are in the know, who they use as a dealer or an advisor and kind of start dating from there. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. So the first thing I said before is you have to buy what you like. Um, buying stuff that you're like, Oh boy, that's brutal. I'll, I'll, but I'll put it away is, 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 is not what I would ever recommend. It's just <laughs> an antithetical to the whole idea of collecting. Um, however, um, you know, you do want to buy things that, obviously will be worth at least what you bought it for down the line, whether that's a year or five years or 50 years, you know, um, you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as you and I discussed in previous conversations, the, the word trust is a, an absolute uh, linchpin, critical. Yeah. A critical linchpin in the, in the world of collecting, finding, um, finding a colleague in the art world, to guide you through it um, will will a save you time, which, as I think you know from your financial clients, no one has anymore. Um, and 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 b will 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 be a way more enjoyable experience. Um, having someone you sort of consider a friend helping you spend what can be quite a bit of money um, is a lot better than going at it either alone or with someone you you just not connecting with. So I. I really think there's a personal aspect to this. This whole business is about relationships and and not really who you know, but who you like. Yeah, <laughs> and who for you sure. Trust, you know, I think I think it's really important. What about um, you, you mentioned something earlier? You know, circling back around to different mediums and the different things. Like obviously, there was the sculptures, tons of sculptures, tons of kinetic art. Uh, well, really, there wasn't tons, but there was some kinetic art there. There was, you know, painting, watercolors. When people think of art. You, traditionally, the first thing I think of is obviously on the wall, and then you start moving around to these big, big sculptures or big pieces that you're like, okay, that is not going in a room that the kids can get to. Uh, right. you know, but there's, yeah. there's, there's a, a myriad of art, and figuring out uh, which of these you're interested in is probably like, do you go to the same person to figure out that, or do you specialize? That's such a good, that's such a good question and a tough question. Um, I, I have so many collectors who collect polar opposite things. Um, you know, I, I have a client that loves um, 19th century American masters, you know, Winslow Homer, um, uh, you know, um, Mary Cassatt, you know, these, they're in every museum in the world. They're American ma masters, but he also has things by pop artists and contemporary sculpture. Um, mm -hmm. and he loves Tiffany lamps. So, you know, I, I never sort of try and pigeonhole someone into, we should just collect kinetic sculpture. We should just connect, collect pointillism. We should just connect African-American art. Um, because why? Like, you know, it's not, this isn't stamps, you know, you're not collecting this one thing that has intrinsic value based on rarity. 
Not wow. that there's anything yeah. wrong with stamp collecting, though, right? Not that there's anything wrong with stamp. <laughs> I wish I had been a stamp dealer. Framing these things is a real pain in the neck. Very expensive. Um, but uh, stamp is one binder that you get at Staples. You just have to stick them in there, and then you put it in a drawer. Um, they immediately have value. You know that they're worth at least what they're printed. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. The, yeah. Although the forever stamp, I think, has ruined that forever. But, oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I really think that that a good collecting a good collection is a is a varied collection um sure there should be some theme there should be some, you know I'm, my i i like painting so i uh, or two-dimensional art so my collection is going to be of painters from the 50s and 60s who are women or whatever I, that's fine because even in those subgroups you have a get you still have a large gamut you know mm -hmm. there are a lot of artists out there <laughs> yeah uh, sure. From unknown to known. So my original contention and the reason that I even went there in the first place was because I wanted to get an idea about uh, monetizing something that is pretty uh, difficult to monetize. And we have seen in the very near past uh, some of these you know, well-funded uh, fractional ownership companies spew onto the scene, which yeah. – Makes a bit of sense, but I think it may be early innings yet. And I'm going to try not to speak any of my name unless they want to, you know, no. feel free to, to, to you know, no, we, give us a call and we'll are. be happy to sponsor. <laughs> but we, if you take a look I, at some yes, of we have, If I can get you a sponsorship out of this, let me know. I will scream the words out. <laughs> you got it. Uh, so but, ultimately, um, one of the, yeah. So what are your thoughts on the, your first thoughts on it? Well, so. Dual ownerships with paintings, dual, you know, fraction, fractionalization, is that what you call it, um, sure. has been going on for longer than people think. Um, uh, the, the late 80s boom, the first real massive art boom, um, which was followed by a massive art crash uh, in the early 90s after, after the markets crash, saw a rise in very wealthy Asian um, collectors buying things at auction. And then, so they didn't fight each other at the auction with the rest of the, the collectors, would hack it out afterwards or all go in on it together, thus reducing the price. Got it. Uh, and then, of course, the crash comes in the early 90s. And that's why we see a sort of a 30, 40 year leak of. Uh, mostly impressionist paintings uh, that have tripped out of Japanese banks who would sort of grab them in foreclosure. Um, so, so that idea is, is not new. Um, what is new is obviously the massive social media platforms that these companies can, can, can sort of reach and make having one tenth of 1% of a very expensive Warhol be something really exciting. We, it's not, art is not the only one that's doing that. We're seeing it with cars. Uh, we're seeing it with, with burka bags. We're seeing it with watches. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, my thoughts on it are that it's less about collecting and way more about investing. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's the only hook in that is I bought this percentage of something and now it's worth more to, yeah, I own eight tenths of a percent of a Warhol and that's great at cocktail parties, but really isn't, you know, not yeah, you lose the utility like, of it too. Soul. This is what I, this is what I own. It's, it's, it's it, that, that's where you sort of pushing up against the NFT world. Right. So I, I think on that note, we, we have a question on the, uh, uh, on that side from, from Mark, uh, since you mentioned the NFT side of the angle. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, my, my experience with, with Art Basel is uh, through uh, the art of Ross Ulbricht. I was the operations leader for Free Ross Dow, which is a, I guess in at at Art Basel Miami, like a famous piece of uh, fractionalized yep. art. So, um, in terms of fractionalization, when it comes to blockchain, what are first of all, what are your opinions on NFTs? Like a lot, there's a lot of varied opinions on that, uh, especially now that 
monkey JPEGs are the pre- predominant form of NFT. Uh, but like, uh, so first of all, those opinions are, 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 I'm curious to what they are. And also when you're talking about fractionalization and losing the utility, do you, do you like, do you like the opportunity that blockchain can represent in terms of bringing some of the utility back in terms of like limited licensing rights to members and that sort of thing? Yeah. It, it's such, it's such a good question. And, and one that, you know, I've, I, I've, I've, talked about ad nauseum with friends and colleagues um me max um i i I don't see i don't see a intrinsic long-lasting value in nfts because of the ability for 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 a lot of non-artistic people to produce them in mass quantities um Yes, you can limit what people get based on you know how they how they open it. It's like a print run, right? Uh, you know, if, if if I do a print of of that um, and I make the run fifty plus a few artist proofs, it's going to be worth far more than if I did it at five thousand. Um, so there is that limitation that the makers of the NFTs or producers of the NFTs can make on each each work, but basically I. I find it the same problem for me with the um, with the, the, the companies that are fractionalizing real art. I'm sorry, not real art, but tangible art, actual art. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a big difference between a six or eight foot Warhol on the wall behind me than showing you whatever the NFT is, whether it's a monkey or not. I get that the monkey is a popular thing. It's here. It's here now. It's it's a thing. But I feel but the like people that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say I feel like um, you know we get to right to the head of it where we talk about scarcity, really, because that's a that's right. a big part of it. Scarcity right. kind of drives the bus, right? Like, uh, and I'd Absolutely. love to talk to you in detail in the future about dead or alive, right? Like, yeah. you know, yes. artists that are. That's a good one you know, dead versus alive versus, you know, the other financial aspects of it, which we obviously could talk for hours about, but, uh, that t- you, the scarcity is the thing that I see it. Now I, I do love the concept of maybe marrying the two, the NFT to the actual piece so that you have provenance so you could protect from any, you know, theft in the future of that piece of art. We'd know yep. how or who owns that specific piece. That would be you know, I'd feel a little safer than just having it hanging on the back of the wall, potentially. Um, thoughts on that, maybe? Smart well, contracts, I, or at yeah, least well, being want, able to want, put it on I chain. Just, yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel like I shortchange Mark on the answer a little bit. On, I just, I remember my my oldest son coming to me and being like, "Dad, there are these NFTs that are coming out that are golf carts." He was a, he liked this particular golfer. And that golfer launched an NFT of him winning a tournament, hitting a ball, or whatever. Like a no different than a baseball card, except an NFT. Um, and the starting price was, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Uh, and by the time the the frenzy had stopped, they were going for a couple thousand bucks. So I, I think what Mark's original point was in asking me how I feel about them. I, I, I think that the short term gain on some of the NFTs are worth it. I, I just worry about longer term investments based in NFTs. I, I, that's, that's, I guess that's the, 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 the long and short of my answer. And I, I didn't mean to sort of go off on a tangent before I just, I think that's an important point because I, I did have that experience with my son of being like, Oh my God, we got to get these. You know, so I have to have them. Um, and, and, you know, we, I think, I thought we, I think we bought one for $300 and sold it a month later for $600. I mean, yay, great. But I, I couldn't have been happier to have been out of it. I, that was like this reaction <laughs> to, to being out yeah. of it, you know, despite, despite the fact that he and I split $150 each. So, um, but, uh, but yeah. So, so uh, is that going to be generation sorry, number four? That. Yeah. Is that Who's generation that? number four? You're getting them. You're, oh, you're, 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 you're five. That's, that's, that's MD, that's MDV. Um, 
Yeah, wow. I did it. Um, sue me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he, we do not call him Max. His name is Quinn, which uh, which is Latin for five. And uh, <laughs> and that's what everyone calls him. Uh, that's awesome. yeah, my dad is alive and kicking and, uh, you know, in great shape. And he's Max. I'm Max. And just another Max would be crazy. So. <laughs> So, so Max, tell me, I mean, that, that goes into it. Tell me about like, how did you, obviously you got started in it because of your family, but mm-hmm. what was that journey like knowing that you had such deep uh, inroads into that? Was that something you felt like you were going to, you know, I kind of owe it to the world to do. Is it something that you just like really mm-hmm. found fascinating mm-hmm. yourself? No, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that my father woke up drank his coffee and looked at the morning paper like every other guy in the world and then went to an art gallery and sold pretty pictures to people or any, but not pretty pictures but paintings to people. And I, I just have these memories of him coming home and me being like, did you sell anything today? And him being like, yes. And just being, it just blew my mind for some reason that, and maybe it's because I, I hadn't yet been educated in art and why, what art was because I was small. Yeah. And then he started taking me to museums. Um, and, and, and the first show he ever saw, showed me was just the, the Impressionist permanent collection at the, at the Met. Um, and I found it to be life altering. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though those aren't nearly my favorite artists yet uh, now, um, they, it just left a lasting impression on me. Um, and he started sort of taking me to more and more sort of not difficult, but more and more sort of sort of complex art, um, or, or abstraction. And and I really, really fell in love with abstraction because of my father. And I, and 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 the thing I tell everybody about why I do this was it was never, ever for even one millisecond pushed on me. Mm-hmm. Um and in fact, I tell my oldest, you know, you're, you are not going into this business. You know? <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it is. It is a it is a weird business. Um, go go do it. Go do what Uncle Frank does. You know? <laughs> <laughs> go, well, I, go I say the same go thing. The, I say the same thing. I mean, there are so many apps out there, so many things out there. It's like using me in many cases or using a financial advisor uh, advisor group in many cases for many people is like using a sledgehammer to hang a painting, right? Because you know, you don't need <laughs> okay. all yeah. of the utility that I have to do something if you're just getting out of school, but it's handy mm-hmm. and I'm happy to do it, but there's not a lot of people that are actually learning to the same extent and trying to learn as much about such a broad field when we have the attention spans of like my app will tell me that this is due and it's higher than what it was last month or last right. week or yesterday. So the, the, the thought there is that people think that they have enough information to make their own best investment decision, which is great. Uh, but yeah. sometimes it's not. And for those of them who it's not, they ultimately find somebody like me who will then walk them through that process. And I suspect for the people who are, tired or interested enough or have fallen in love enough like my moment in the met was i i you know poor kid east plano moved to new york city uh little known fact about the met is that it's suggested donation which means that you could go in and give them a donation of a dollar, even though it says 23 up there, you know? And right. so I spent many a weekend going there and, and spending my extra $4 on a cup of coffee and just staring at the art from the, you know, from the coffee shop. And when I first walked in there and I stood in front of those <clears throat> huge destriers with the, the mounted, yeah. you know, I just stood there for 20 yeah. minutes staring at it and just fascinated. I mean, you can't go into that museum and expect to get out of there everything in one day that is just no. immense and it's so no. stimulatingly overwhelmingly amazing that maybe you make that jump from target art to hey what if i buy something that really will be a value that i didn't necessarily see on a cruise right. ship lithograph of uh lichtenstein that's right. definitely going to go up in value <laughs> yeah yeah it's a, i've heard of him it's got to be it's got to be valuable yeah you know? yeah that's how that's how uh royal caribbean got it. 
<laughs> it's so funny because I told that story to someone who's like, where, what, I've been on a cruise. I've never said, I was like, I can assure you that's a true story because yeah, someone called absolutely. me and asked me if I thought it was a great idea. And I was like, you're on a cruise ship. No, it's a terrible yeah. idea. Yes. Yeah, no. You're, he bought it anyway. He bought it. Do not buy that. <laughs> <laughs> so what my thought is, uh, again, you know, thanks for coming on and talking a little bit about Art Basel and packing that. But I would love, this is such a complex and fascinating subject that I would love to have you on maybe once a month and talk about Perfect. making a, a journey from, you know, from the beginning to really educating that first piece of art that maybe we buy together. Great. I would love that. Yeah. I, yeah. This is, this is fun. This is a very easy forum. I, I will, I will do you a huge favor and get the ring light. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you, if you saw my setup right now, it, you'd laugh at me. Uh, oh, but, please. You know, Look, that's yeah. the beauty. Like you could do this from a cell phone. Now you should have seen all the people yeah. at the conference that were the conference at the, at the fair that were, they had a microphone running to their cell phone and somebody was videoing while they're taping. It was great. You know, I mean, yeah. you can, oh, you yeah. can do it, so much it, with so little now. We, uh, we, we actually once sold a painting at Art Basel, um, an expensive one too, to a, to a collector we had, we had, um, had sold to before, um, whose ex-wife was also a client of ours. And he called the ex-wife to see if she thought he should buy it. And she said, yes, but it's still to this day, the most bizarre, um, interlude between somebody <laughs> deciding to buy something and, 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 or not. Uh, well, clearly she had good decision-making ability if they got divorced. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, Won't I, choose I just, me, but she'll choose the After the whole deal was done, he said, look at me, he's like, thanks, this is great. I'm really happy. And I was like, I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really just have to know, like, why, there's a dynamic here that obviously still works. So tell me, like, you know. So oh uh, he was like, yeah, you don't want to know. <laughs> um, but uh yeah no it, it's uh it's 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 an odd world and uh i'd love to explore with you whenever you want oh that would be fantastic that'd be fantastic yeah. now if people wanted to find more about you or about your services and about like what you've done and what you you'd be willing to work with how would they get in touch with you how would they find you um you can email me call me um i'm, I'm on uh, instagram um posting stuff all the time uh, so you DM me on there. Um, but um, my my advisory is called IV Projects, uh, uh, which uh, was was thought up, you know, probably over a drink or two. Um, you know, uh, the Davidson name is is, a, is an old and long one, but I thought for something that really is sort of a side project, it, it should be IV Projects because um, I'm sort of open to doing anything with it, whether it's curating or advising people or whatever. Right. And it's, you know, for those people out there that, like me, have a, a, a history in learning about this stuff from a liberal arts background, but Damn. always wanting to have, like, purchased something and feeling like that legacy is important, uh, it's just so hard and uncomfortable. Like, I know how people feel when they come to me for the first time. They're like, I, I don't know anything. It is. Please it's help a, me. It's a, it it's a sticky, it's a sticky process if you've never done it before. I, I grant you that. Um, it's sort of the, it's sort of the DMV of investing, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you, you get out of line and you get up there, you don't have the right stuff and you got to go back to the end of the line. It's, it's, um, I, I get it. Um, but it's really not as bad as you think because you are the one that has the money and you're going to give it to somebody else. So, you know, if you're not feeling it from them, always think of that in the back of your mind. That is, you know, you're the client, you know, uh, and you're the client, uh, when you walk into someone's booth or gallery or, you know, make a call with a consultant or whatever that you're the client. It's, uh, yeah. You know, no deals better than a bad deal. Right. Right. And, and, and there's, <laughs> there's, there's three more of these that I could, I could do with you of, of insane stories about, what me as a dealer or an auction person or a consultant has done for people, you know, yeah, um, for sure. So, for sure. Um, it, there's a very sort of devil meets uh, devil wars Prada uh, sort of aspect to it. You, you become this guy that went to school and learned art history and runs a business to um, administrative assistant really quickly. 
Um, you know, it's um, yeah, it's fascinating to like. I, th- there's so much to unpack. Like I, I don't even like. I know for sure that we could talk for hours and days about yeah. the fees and the background and the and you know we don't want to spill it all. So. You know, no. we, we, we need the, the art world to work in their opaque way because it has for centuries, right? So the content is infinite. <laughs> That's great. If you don't mind, just some, uh, Mark, I know, has some some questions. Yeah, of course. Um, specific to, so Mark's um, history and background, maybe you want to introduce yourself, Mark, and talk a little bit about your history and what yeah. you, your... I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a tech guy and I'm a journalist. I've been uh, writing about cool. cutting edge stuff in tech for... Uh, writing and videoing about it, I guess, for a uh, better part of a couple of decades. But uh, yeah. um, I fell into crypto, and then when NFTs blew up, I fell into DAOs and NFTs, uh, and that's mm-hmm. what got me started buying art and, and all that sort of stuff, uh, s- much like a lot of people. So it's kind of like that 80s revolution that sure. you know caused that bubble. Uh, but I did buy, you know, I've, I've got, I've collected stuff from like Shepard Fairey and, you know, yeah, like some, some, sure. not just, not just monkey JPEGs. Um, I, I figured you, you weren't, uh, you weren't long on, on monkey JPEGs. No. I figured, yeah, you figured, yeah. I mean, it's good for the guys that like them, but they're like, you know, they're like, like collecting Rolexes, you know, it's just a status symbol, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Which is fine for them. Uh, I am curious, though. For, uh, this is a question for both of you, since you were both at the at the fair. Um, like two years ago, NFTs was like the dominant kind of like let's let's be cool on the cutting edge thing. And then, uh, like last year, I, I I wasn't really paying attention as much last year. But like this year, I mean, obviously AI in art is a much bigger thing out in kind of the world. And then I saw that video of like the little robot look kind of looked like Sophia. That, that was, was consensus your... though. That was oh, one that was of the consensus. things that was interesting is that was consensus and oh, okay. that was actually really neat, but she wasn't there. Oh. I, that's why I was laughing. I was like, <laughs> there's a couple of things here that aren't supposed to be. <laughs> All right. All right. So I was actually curious if that was like something that was happening. Like, cause you talked a little bit about kinetic or practical. No, surprisingly, I did not see, anything that um that seemed to have anything to do Me. with nfts at all i mean and that was a, a, along three different shows three different fairs sorry right yeah I mean, so, so mark so- a comment a comment on that um two years ago when we i agree with you there was a lot of that 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 thing there mm-hmm. um and that's a lot of it because the art world and the art business was ripping um mm-hmm. And I think um, I think people had big falls anywhere, anyway, big you know autumn seasons, um, and they could they could dedicate some of that extremely expensive real estate at Art Basel or wherever on on an NFT because it was speculative and people were buying it. Right. Uh, I think last year it was there's still there's still something here um, sales wise, um, but. That was the emperor's new. That's the that was the emperor's new clothes last year, and this year I got to do some other things, and this artist wants to show, and and this year it has been a rough fall in the art world, and I don't think anyone was taking any chances. And I thought the actual subject matter of the art itself at Art Basel was super safe. Yeah, I they agree were, with you. There, that was they interesting. Were there, they were there to refill the coffers, and that was that was it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. Um, seemed- that, very, Sorry, that, that's really what I've heard from people um, and from the dealers I've spoken to who, you know, were like, yep, yeah, things are better now, you know. Um, <laughs> that's but, that's uh, good info. That I like sucked. that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that. Yeah, I saw the same thing. I saw uh, everything that I saw was pretty traditional. There was, as I said, there were a couple of pieces that were tailor sculpted, uh, sculpted for the show, you know, to, to bring people in. There's a Japanese artist who did some pretty interesting stuff. There's a you definitely guys caught it. It was like a, a big sculptor. It was a blue thing, but uh, I didn't see anything that was really. I guess the closest thing to questionable was I saw some video art, but I didn't see. Yeah, I didn't I, see, I didn't see um, any anything nothing literally installation or nothing like it was kind of on the edge of you know. The closest thing I saw was like when I walked up to that white device and it kind of made some pixelization of the body. You know, that mm-hmm. was about the closest thing that I saw yes. to anything that was digital. I mean, what- there's a there's a gallery there's a gallery that does they either do untitled or nada, and they're called Bitforms, um, hmm. 
look them up. They're, they most of the Mark. I think you'd really dig them. Um, they they are they are pretty much only artists that use some sort of digital media. They're in New York uh, bit forms. They're they're great. Super cool stuff. Um, they they don't, to my knowledge, do a ton of NFT stuff, but they they really do a lot of uh, two and three D art that incorporate robotics, right. kineticism, all that stuff. They're they're, they're very cool. There, there's some interesting like concepts that like I, I really only see it talked about not really I don't know of any artists that are really doing it but like concepts of where the art is kind of like the the algorithm or the filter that mm -hmm. um, and I, I see people talking about like how that is a good match for NFT because you can actually put the data into the like intrinsically tie it to the contract as opposed to it pointing to a JPEG somewhere right right where and so then the the actual art which can be implemented on like a TV or an installation is intrinsically tied to the smart contract and can be traded and owned and that sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it sounds kind of like those Bitforms thing you're describing a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Check Bitforms gallery out. I, I think they're great. And um, you know, I, I, I see it. I've been, I've been next to them at fairs. I've been, you know, they're, they're, they're super, super on the front edge of that type of art, you know, cool. I'm always, I, I don't envy their, uh, gallery set their booth setups like cords <laughs> going everywhere and like, you know trying to hide stuff behind walls and i'm always like oh that, knock that, knock knock into the wall that's that's that, that was the struggle with uh, free ross Dow is because he had a mix of physical art and mm -hmm. digital art and so we uh, we did like a you know, he. I don't know if you know the story of Ross Ulbrich, but like he, he went to. He's in prison. He's for, in prison right? for double life plus forty, uh, oh, for God. for building a website, and uh, oh, he, this is Silk Road guy. Silk Road guy, yeah. yeah. And so one of the so he had these like five digital pieces that were scanned pieces, but also he had four or five uh, oil pieces that he had put out that were part of our collection, and uh, then he had an animation that he hand drew while he was in solitary and confinement and then we had a studio convert into a digital animation which you had to view inside of a uh, a physical solitary confinement cell that we would set up at art installations like uh, we set it up Wild. at bitcoin mammy it's currently on the kind of a permanent loan to a, a museum in nashville I like the idea of if you own the art, do like a, a Bill Gates kind of setup where you just wear the little badge in the house and all of a sudden it sticks it the shows art up onto the TVs. wall. So like based on yeah. your taste, we're going to put up all the impressions, you know? <laughs> very mi very minority report. Yeah. <laughs> but the, 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 the funny stories about the, the solitary confinement installation uh, were crazy. Because like when we, had, we first did it, we were at Bitcoin Miami and – so we had to actually order like the the solitary confinement toilet in the sink and the mirror from a prison supply store and like we had it delivered to this like massive mansion from a friend of a friend that was on turtle island in miami is like it, he lives in oh, yeah. oprah's neighborhood and he's getting all his prison equipment <laughs> delivered by a delivery truck he's like what's going on <laughs> so, yeah talk about hiding cords and stuff that yeah. was uh Right. <laughs> so, what do you want to talk about next time? Like the profile of an uh, the profile of a uh, a fledgling collector or a brand new collector. Like what you? Why don't we? Where, talk, I mean, like why don't we do what, something like that where we profile what yeah. a, a fledgling collector? Uh, what your conversation would be? Yeah. Sure. Like the 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 pitch. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think I think there should also be sort of a, a pitch from the, the collector himself. Like, this is what I think I want to do, you know. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, I, I can tell stories about, or I can tell sort of real life experiences of collectors who have come to me being like, "This is what I want to collect, and this is what I want to spend," and that was like ten million dollars and an entire like different medium ago, you know. Yeah. Um, so you know, it it really is it really is getting eyes in front of things and, you know, yeah. falling in love with art is a very sort of natural process. You know, um, a lot of times it's just whether you can, you can afford it. Yeah, for sure. That um, affectation, uh, right. It's, I, I'll, I'll yeah, never forget right. my 
first trip to New York when I got hired and uh, a friend of mine from uh, high school, actually, we ran into each other on at the airport and I told him that I was moving to New York and I asked him if he had any recommendations as to like, you know, what neighborhoods and what to do and how to do it. And so he takes me around and at the time I'm living um, way high up off of like 102nd Street in Central Park West, which sounds great. It's not. Um, it wasn't then anyway. And uh, we started looking around at different neighborhoods and I, I settled on the Upper West. I was like, I really like this neighborhood. And he goes, yeah, you would have you, you clearly have a a silver spoon mentality and, and, and not a copper pot to own. <laughs> you know, I was like, Ch okay. champagne, champagne taste out of your right. budget. That's <laughs> right. So it's I kind of feel I got, some I got a lot of those. Yeah. I have yeah. a lot of clients like that. Yes, I want to oh, pay God, ten dollars. I want ten dollars and just get me the guy that's gonna be famous in ten years. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yes. That you're like, like I hear plan. what you do is super easy. Um, here's a hundred bucks. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> Spend money to make money. Oh, that's great. That's great.